Welcome back to the Mountain Morning Show. You know that we are fans of the Utah Council for Citizen Diplomacy and what they do at Westminster College. That's their, their home, as it were. And uh, one of their most popular things that's coming to the end for this year is their World Affairs Lecture Series. I'm very happy to have, uh, happy to have Stephen Ehrlich here, uh, who will be speaking, uh, and uh, his lecture is this evening at uh, Westminster. Welcome to the show, sir. Great, thanks, sir. Great Having to have me. you here. I am so excited to talk to you because uh, your topic is uh, one of my very favorites, Bitcoin. Yes. Yeah, uh, this is something that I, I wonder how many people saw this coming. I remember uh, when I was young, uh, you know, and I was a little bit of a hacker in my day mm -hmm. with my Commodore 64. <laughs> I could do quite a few things with that the little computer. Um, but uh, I remember seeing people who were figuring out how to break into ATMs and do things that were way more impressive. And at that point, you started wondering what was going to happen as money became digital. And, uh, you know, of course, there was all kinds of issues with that, uh, you know, from uh, double spending and different things. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure people knew or thought that maybe we'd ever get to this point where we'd have a currency in this form, but we do. Yeah, we do. It's, uh, as you kind of said, there's been, Bitcoin's not the first digital currency right. that has ever been invented. But what it is... It's it, the first one to work. It's the yeah, it's the first <laughs> one to work. First one to work. It's the first one that's ever solved the double spend problem, which is right. if I give you a piece of digital currency, you can be absolutely certain that I cannot then give it to somebody else. So when you hold on to it and go to spend it, you can you can use it. Yeah, we know it's mine, and that comes from the back, uh, the uh, what should we say, the clearinghouse behind all of this, which is different than others. It's not like a traditional bank. This is managed by the people who are part of Bitcoin, the miners, mm -hmm. the the people who have computers running uh, as part of this. I don't know what should we call it consortium. I don't know what's the word for that. It, it's a community. I guess. I guess. Community. I guess consortium makes um, could work as well. But uh, Bitcoin is a distribu is, is a distributed or decentralized cryptocurrency. And basically, what that means is that there is no central issuer. Right. As a point of reference, uh, people can have airline miles. They can have reward points from Starbucks and other retailers. And there's one company that's in charge of dispersing it. Right. And managing who owns what. Bitcoin's completely decentralized, so you rely on a network of miners to pass transactions along from each other, validate them, and then add them to the blockchain to, to create an immutable red, uh, ledger of record that anybody can go and verify to make sure that you are the only people, you are the only person that can spend the Bitcoins in your account. So they're watching all those transactions, but the other thing they're doing, as I understand it, is that mining part of it, mm -hmm. which is bringing more currency into the market, right? S sort of. that work? So, so mining is, is, there's a few different things going on with mining. Miners essentially are, are nodes on the network and, and users that lend their computing power to help validate transactions and then add them, add them onto the blockchain, right. which, is a, which is a record. Now, a lot of people have questions. If there's no central issuer, how are new Bitcoins created? And that's from the process called mining. As miners go through and, and check to make sure that all the, all the transactions adhere to the rules of script and there's no errors, uh, they get money also, people pay very small fees, a couple of cents for transactions to be added, but then at the same time that they are validating transactions, miners are also working to solve a very difficult computational problem. Yeah, they're big algorithms. Yeah, they're actually racing against each other using a process called hashing, which there is essentially an encryption algorithm where they have to find a unique value. Uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, the pseudonymous uh, Yeah, he started all this. Found, he actually said this, the, the equivalent of solving this computational problem is flipping 37 coins at one time and having them all come up as heads. So wow. very, very, very difficult. But if you do solve it and the, the Bitcoin protocol is designed so one is solved every 10 minutes, you are allowed to, all, aside from all the transactions that you add to the network, you're allowed to create one additional transaction where at this point you, are allowed, you can create 25 Bitcoins that can be added to your account. That amount decreases by that, I'm sorry, that amount halves about every four years. So at some point this year, that's going to decrease to 12 and a half Bitcoins for each successfully mined block. At some point, we'll reach a point where very little is being produced. Is that right? Yeah, it's designed to, to be introduced into the system at a decreasing rate. The year 2140, the, uh, the 21 millionth Bitcoin is going to be created, and then there's going to be no more. At that point, there's actually going to be some questions wow. related to the economics yeah. of mining. And what people are hoping is that transaction fees will increase enough to, comp to compensate miners for the lower rewards that they would receive for successfully mining blocks. You know, I've, I've watched, I've had friends who have, have lined up a, a bank of computers 
uh, it spent all kinds of power to try to get uh, to try to mine a coin. Uh, it is, I think, for some of them, a little futile. They the people have left it. Yeah. Uh, especially, you know, I, I think the miners are specifically the ones who are like, ah, yeah. I'm not sure if this is paying off. Are we seeing a decline a little bit in the excitement of Bitcoin? Is that what's really happening? What, what, what's causing it no, to just kind of, it, it's certainly out of the news a little more, it, it, it's kind of calmed down a little bit, I should say. Well, the miners, I mean, just to briefly address the first part of the question. Yeah. So, so mining is actually becoming a, a, an arms race. As, as the uh -huh. Bitcoin price appreciated, uh, it peaked around $1,300 at the end of 2013, wow. dropped, and it's starting to go up again now. It's about $450 or so. But th it created a bit of a gold rush, which then led right. to a, a concentration in the mining community to the point where when Bitcoin was initially created, people could actually mine them on their home computers. Yeah. And then it be, they had to use GPUs. And today, if you want to mine, you actually have to ha use an ASIC chip or an app application-specific integrated circuit and, and dedicated mining rigs to the point for it to be economically viable for you. For some people, that if they want to still do it, but they don't want to spend that much money, they can join pools where they share resources and, and rewards. But mining power is continuing to increase, but the price is also increasing because moving beyond just Bitcoin as a payment system, a lot of people are now turning their attention to the blockchain and a number of very interesting applications that can be applied to economic development, can be applied to the financial sector, and a number of other verticals. So and other that, places to, to, to add value. Mm -hmm. This is interesting. Well, I've got a lot more questions about this. We're going to take a quick break. We'll come back and talk a little bit more about uh, Bitcoin. We're talking with Stephen Ehrlich. We'll be back with more right after this. Welcome back to the Mountain Morning Show. We're continuing our conversation with Stephen Ehrlich. He is here with the Utah Council for Citizen Diplomacy. It's part of their World Affairs Lecture Series. He's speaking tonight at Westminster College. Yes. And we are having a lot of fun because we're talking about Bitcoin. We're talking about a lot of stuff, you and I, <laughs> which is great. But uh, we'll continue uh, specifically about Bitcoin. We were mentioning uh, as we went to break, we we're talking about mining and, and how that's mm -hmm. different, but adding some other dimension to uh, the backside of the operation of, of Bitcoin, which will add some other value points, some things that uh, that might change things up a little bit. Talk to me about that a little more. Sure. So, a lot of people look at Bitcoin as as a payment system and a way of of using of engaging in commerce. Right. The problem is, it, while it's nice to it's nice to be able to go to a coffee shop and if you have a merchant that accepts right. Bitcoin, you put your phone up just like Apple Pay or Samsung Pay, and and it's fun, but a lot, of, a lot of people and skeptics uh, rightfully ask, what is the real value add? I mean, is this, is this something new or is this really a solution looking right. for a problem to solve? <laughs> and uh, and, and it's, hard to, it's hard to argue with that because while there are inefficiencies in our payment system, most of us don't have a, don't have a problem giving a credit card and, and buying something. Let me ask you an important question then, because uh, I, I think this is something that a lot of people kind of wonder about. If we were to find out tomorrow that all the gold bullion that we believe is locked up and somehow uh, kind of supports our economic, uh, our, our, well, our value economically, mm -hmm. worldwide. If, that were, if we were to find out it was gone, wouldn't we be almost in the exact same position with the dollar that people find themselves in essentially with Bitcoin in some manner? Would that be similar uh, in that? I, I just look at that situation and go, well, then I'm going to probably want Bitcoin. <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't I? <laughs> wouldn't I like that better than what I might have with the dollar? Yeah, I mean, I think like, like Bitcoin, like the dollar or, or, or gold, the gold standard, I mean, there has to ha it has to have some sort of intrinsic value. Yeah, there's got to be something yeah. somewhere. I, I mean, the dollar is worth a dollar because it's backed by the United States government. It's full faith and credit. And the government has guns, which says that you have to accept it as legal tender. <laughs> I mean, Bitcoin, Bitcoin is a little bit, you have to believe, yeah, like Tinkerbell, you kind of have to believe in it that it's going to be worth something. Right. And, and personally, I believe that value comes from its ability to kind of engage in, in smart contracts. It's the ability to essentially be programmable money, help hide some personal data for people that don't want to tell their entire life story to Amazon so they can buy a book online. So you, right. have to, you have to believe that there are some unique properties of it that make it a better solution for, for commerce or other, or other means of, of uh, other means of interacting with the world beyond what we have today. Do you think uh, there's a future where Bitcoin might be that solution, where we might 
not have to worry about whether the euro is doing okay, whether the dollar, how the dollar matches up. Could we be uh, ever in a position where that would work? It's possible. I mean, it's it's way too early, way too early to tell. A lot of people, especially the people who were first involved in creating Bitcoin and, and talking about it were seen as crypto anarchists or ardent libertarians right. that wanted to circumvent Cyberpunks. the Yeah. Wanted to <laughs> wanted to circumvent the entire financial system. I mean yeah. to to me that's that's not what the goal is. If that's the standard, I don't think that's gonna be successful. That's not what Nakamoto had in mind, right? I, I don't know. I, I believe I mean I think that's I, I think that is sort of where it came from as a yeah. as a peer to peer trustless way of of transmitting scarce digital goods, yeah. but I, I think once you get to the practicalities of today, if that is the way that you're going about your business, you're not going to be successful. I think that it's important to work with partners in financial institutions and, and large companies and other verticals so that you can engage in trial and error in partnerships and, and figure out what works. Th this technology gets a lot of attention because it's so new that it can theoretically be applied to anything and and that's dangerous i mean you right. have to you have to figure out what are the best possible use cases and then go after them if it's uh, the, another saying that i hear a lot is if you're a hammer everything looks like a nail that's i mean that is not that that's not how i want to that's not how i think we should talk about bitcoin because then you're going to lose people if right. you're trying to completely transform the world it has to you have to kind of dip your toes into it and and so. and lead people in a way that they in the direction that they want to go in. Maybe this is the first iteration, and maybe there's something new that yeah. comes along that takes us to that next step. Sure, I mean. That would be typical of technology, we yeah. see it a lot. I mean, a lot of people don't realize that Bitcoin is not even the only, it's not the only digital right. currency in the world. There are thousands, most of which are not worth anything. The, the Bitcoin protocol, Bitcoin code is open source. Anybody can download it, and if I wanted to go uh, back to my hotel later tonight and create Stevecoin, I could download the Bitcoin core software, change every that. mention of Bitcoin to Stevecoin, and all of a sudden I own a ton of Steve coins. There are others that are, are worth, that, that have some pretty significant market capitalizations. So one, Ethereum is over a billion dollars. And aside from that, a lot of companies are actually working to build uh, blockchain solutions. Some are open, like the Bitcoin, which anyone can right. join, and others are closed, proprietary, or what we call permissioned, where you have, they validate the nodes that are on it, and they're working on internal solutions to kind of help build efficiency into their operations. Wow. So th it's gonna fan out to a wide range of solutions and problems and pilot projects, and we'll, we'll have to kind of just see what sticks. It's fascinating. We'll hear more about this uh, tonight. Uh, at uh, the World Affairs Lecture mm -hmm. Series. That's at Westminster College at the Vive Gore Concert Hall, I believe, tonight, yes. right? Yeah. Uh, what time are you speaking? I believe 7. 7, seven o'clock. All right, yeah, great. Well, it's going to be fascinating to hear more from you. I, I wish you'd told me that your Steve Coin wasn't, uh, there wasn't a lot of value before I bought <laughs> 300 of them. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, it's great having yeah. you here. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. Stephen Ehrlich. We'll be back with more here on the Mountain Morning Show after these messages.